Well, good morning, everyone, and uh, welcome to this webinar brought to you in association uh, you in association for the uh, association for project safety uh, and in association with IdeaGen Mail Manager. Today, uh, we're focusing on information management. As many of you uh, will be aware, better information management uh, through the so-called golden thread of information is a key requirement in the Building Safety Act. And there's a great deal of work going on uh, across the sector to ensure this is implemented effectively. First off, uh, we'll be hearing um, about the, the work of the uh, Building Safety Alliance. Um, who will be uh, Building Safety Alliance, who will be providing um, an update on the Act and its best practice advice for information assurance and complying with the golden thread. Uh, we also have a, a case study on information management from Clarion Housing and IdeaGen Mail Manager will focus on the often neglected part of information management, which is email management. Uh, there'll be a Q&A session after all the speakers have concluded their presentation. Uh, but first, let me introduce our speakers. Uh, we have Anthony Taylor, who's the Managing uh, Director of uh, Resolve Risk, and Mark Snelling, MD of Safety Mark Consultancy Services. Uh, they both represent the Building Safety Alliance. We have Jack White, Technical Manager of Clarion Housing Group, and Ben Thomas, Senior Account Executive at IGEAGEN Mail Manager. And I'm Denise Shevin, the Editor of Project Safety Journal, uh, which is the magazine of the Association for Project Safety. And I'm chairing this morning. Uh, before we start, uh, we have a few housekeeping points to, to mention. Um, to ask a question, please use the Q&A function, not the chat function, uh, if you don't mind. Uh, you can pose questions as yourself or anonymously, not as someone else. Uh, the speakers will address your questions in the Q&A session at the end. Um, also, just to let you know, the webinar is being recorded and will be available to watch on demand later today. Uh, and that would be via the original registration link. It's actually one hour's uh, CPD credit uh, for those who complete this webinar live. CPD certificates uh, will be issued a couple of hours after the webinar has finished. I think um, that's enough of that. I don't think there's any more uh, housekeeping points I need to raise. So uh, due to uh, a diary clash, uh, Anthony uh, Taylor and Mark Snelling uh, recorded their presentation in advance. Um, Anthony will be with us over the Q&A. So I'm going to ask uh, my colleague, uh, Justin, uh, to uh, play the recorded presentation. Over to you, Justin. Thank you. OK, there we go. the forgive me that's the that's the wrong one i'm sharing there let me share the right screen there we go and, up, and away we go good morning all i'm going to go briefly through a bit of the history of the building safety alliance when where we are now and then we'll talk to you about what we're doing uh, and Mark is going to go into a bit more depth about some of the assurance and the thing that responds directly to the legislation as it is now in front of us. The Building Safety Alliance basically grew out of, I was asked to be the independent chair of Working Group 8, which was designed to look at um, the delivery of competence for the building safety manager, uh, which we did do, uh, and we put that to the BSI um, eventually, uh, and they took that forward, and then at some point, and in fact, it was at the point that the uh, the uh, regulator 
decided to remove the building safety manager from the uh, the transition from the building safety bill to the building safety act so it was it, it disappeared nevertheless the role and the responsibilities under the act remained and as a result uh, we reworked the um, all the work that we've been doing with PAS 8673 uh, which provides guidance or, or a competence framework for those with the responsibility for management of safety in residential buildings. And we were very careful to make sure that it included the requirements of the, build, the new Building Safety Act, but it also uh, involved requirements, all the stuff that we'd had before. And it does not, it is not limited to the management of safety in high rise or high risk buildings, any residential or blocks of buildings. So very well worth doing that. Um, however, the working group also made a number of recommendations uh, within our uh, document and our report, which was put into raising the bar, the IRGs raising the bar. Uh, our report was safer people, safer homes and building safety management. So once we had delivered our framework document into the BSI, essentially working group eight's job was done. We therefore decided to take the wealth of expertise that was around the table and indeed the cooperation and um, coordination that we've managed to forge over the three or four years that we've been involved. And we created something called the Building Safety Alliance, because within the occupied residential sector, there was no singular forum for the whole sector to come together and debate matters of importance. Of course, the effect of the Building Safety Act on the management of residential buildings is significant. Uh, so we created this uh, and we had our first meeting in March 21, uh, where we had, I think, if I recall, about 50 or 60 people from right there across the, the there. We had public sector housing, private sector housing, insurers, uh, uh, and a number of others, you know, service providers, FMs, managing agents. So right the way across the, um, the forum for those working in the residential um, occupied estate. So, and that carries on. So that was the point of that. We, we incorporated a company in April 21. That was as much to make sure that we could collect the word because at that point, of course, people were registering the names and websites as quick as possible. So we did that. That at the moment has not actually done anything. It's just sitting there. And we're in the process right now of creating the Building Safety Alliance as a charity, which we're assuming will be um, formally accepted and be a legal entity by quarter one, 2024. So we've come an awful long way from there. Um, and within, within the group, which is now about 150 odd uh, regular supporters, we term them, uh, because at the moment there is not a, uh, so much as an entity, a legal entity to do it, so they support us. Uh, we've obviously got a, a number of people representing the resident's voice, which is important, and we're very pleased uh, that the regulator and the policy makers in BSR, Duluc, uh, uh, UCAS, and the LGA, and indeed the Welsh Government, all um, usually uh, appear as observers at all the meetings that we have. So it, it has some traction. We are the voice of the residential sector, uh, and that's the point of it. Part of that is, you will see here, I, I've just put that slide up because it explains how we're set up. We will be having the, the uh, charity, which is the top right blue bit. In the middle there, we have the council, which is essentially the forum, which is the 150 members who will attend. And they will make the recommendations of what the sector wants to the charity and the charity will enact it. And if necessary, will direct the limited company in order to potentially um, undertake commercial contracts in one form or another. But the real bit there is the SIGs, which is that block of little bits and pieces down the bottom, where we have a number, we've got about six running at the moment, where we undertake specific bits of work to try and clarify um, either what the regulations mean or to provide guidance um, with regard to the practicalities of meeting the requirements of, 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 of the, um, the regulations. Now, it's important that you understand that the trustees of the Building Safety Alliance charity are the Property Institute, for those that don't know, is made up of the, uh, the um, Institute of Residential Managers and Armour when they combined. 
We've got the IWFM, which is Institute of Workplace and Facilities Management, and we've got the Association for Project Safety for the for the the bits of the building work that often undergoes. So we have, I would suggest, there with the backing also of the CIC, um, who have got a member of the CIC as a trustee. They all those organisations are putting people forward as the trustees to operate the charity. The point of that, and I, I um, you know, as the sort of independent chair of it at the moment, uh, I'm very pleased that they have taken up the cudgel uh, because they are the most influential groupings out there in the um, in the in the forum at the moment. So we have got a powerful collection of influencers around us. As you can see, you know, we've got quite a lot of work to be done. Uh, and I'm going to hand over to Mark now, who's going to go into a bit more depth about the specifics about A, organisational capability, and then B, some other work that we've been doing in another special interest group with regard to the Golden Thread, and most particularly Assurance, which is really at the heart of all of this. So, Mark, can I hand over to you? Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, the requirements in law are set out um, separately in, in part two, which covers the building regulations, and part four, which deals with um, the management of high-rise buildings. The definitions are, are similar, but they are different. Uh, when we looked at, uh, um, um, and there are two requirements, as we see on the next slide, that, that deals with the skills, knowledge, experience and behaviours of individuals and then organisational capabilities of organisations. And when we when we started looking at this, we realised that there, there are a number of standards uh, and publications that talk about organisational capability, but none that talk about organisational capability in this particular context. And it became clear that to be able to for people to demonstrate and others to measure and and to be able to evidence to clients that an organization had organizational capability, uh, we needed a standard. Uh, we needed that standard to be appropriate for large organizations and for micro organizations as well. And we are it, the work we are doing is being um, done in consultation with um, the British Standards uh, CPB1 work group, which is looking at um, organisational capability. And the idea is that we are trying to get a document out there quickly to allow industry to, to get started. And then the work will be handed back to that subgroup to take forward uh, in whatever format they agree. So looking at the two... two um, uh, legal requirements um one this this first one part three relates to building work and design work so any designer any contractor any principal contractor uh, any principal designer uh, where the person is um an individual they need to have the skills knowledge and ex ex skills knowledge experience and behaviors and where they are an organization the organizational capability and in both cases that's to deliver building work in accordance with, with the uh, relevant requirements and design work so that if it was built, that it would be in accordance with the relevant requirements. Where somebody is in training, they need to be uh, supervised by somebody with the necessary skills, knowledge, experience and behaviours. Moving on to occupation, uh, it's dealt with in the prescribed principles um, and it requires uh, an accountable person to ensure that any person uh, responsible for assisting them with their duties under part four has the relevant competence and and the relevant competence is described in in the regulations as skills knowledge experience necessary to perform the functions for which they are responsible in a satisfactory manner for the organizational capability similarly to um, perform the functions they're responsible for uh, in a satisfactory manner to try to capture both definitions, um, because it, it, it makes no sense to have one definition or, or two definitions um, within one standard, uh, and to also capture some of the other key requirements as set out in the, <clears throat> the various standards, um, particularly those relating to behaviours, uh, we've come up with, a, with one definition. Organisational capability, uh, brackets the management of competence, 
means the appropriate management policies, procedures, systems and resources to ensure uh, the organisation has the collective scab uh, necessary to deliver the objective. So we, we were keen that it, it that the breadth of the organisation, so the organisation had enough people, enough competent people to do whatever they intended to do. And then the depth is that individuals under the control of the organisation um, who are working on behalf of that organisation uh, have the necessary skills, knowledge, experience to deliver their role. So every person within that organisation is competent or is being supervised by um, somebody that's competent. So because it, it's possible to have everybody competent, but are not enough competent people to deliver your objectives. And the term persons relates to individuals that no matter what, what uh, whether they're employed or contracted, it, it, it's everybody's competent. And then the separate piece, we realised that certainly in um, occupation, a lot of work is done uh, for and on behalf of, so you have a managing agent, a facilities manager, uh, engaging other contractors to do things, so that it was important that as part of this definition, we included uh, ensuring organisations engaged by that organisation, uh, rather than employed by that organisation, engaged by that organisation, they have the necessary competence. And then the final bit, which is really, really important, is an appropriate standard of organisational culture. Um, and we decided that that would be a standard organisational culture that facilitates uh, safe and healthy built environments. Fundamentally, an individual needs to be able to behave as they are required to by law. And that means not working outside their competence, um, not doing anything that that is is not permitted by the law. So if they say, I'm sorry, I'm not competent, that will be embraced by the organisation rather than to they're told to just get on with it. What does it look like in practice? Um, we've applied uh, the, the, the standard management system template and tried to look at the component parts, uh, starting on the left side. Um, for any system, you need to identify what standards are applied to it. So that's the requirements. Um, we're talking about the legislation and, and the uh, the past standards. And then the organization decides what they want to deliver. Uh, next piece, top management leadership. It, you can't deliver this without, without top management commitment, any management standard. Planning, it's really that uh, gap analysis. It's working out where you are now, where you need to be, and then putting in the plans to achieve that you need to resource whatever you're going to do. And then operation perhaps is the, is the most interesting thing uh, from what it means in, in practice is what, what, what systems do you need in place? Well, you need arrangements for recruitment, training and development, performance management, career development, succession planning, uh, really important contraction, consultant engagement and management, project competence, because the organisation could have a lot of people but you might not have enough people uh, appointed or competent people to, appointed to a particular project or a particular building to be managed. And then appropriate standards of organisational capability or sorry, organisational culture, which we're working on. And then, of course, with any management system, um, monitor, review and take action so that you continually improve. Why did we need to do it? Well, I was set the challenge, Anthony set the challenge. So we, we need to be able to set up a scheme to accredit organizations. There's a organizations need to be accredited, uh, need to be able to demonstrate to principal accountable persons, accountable persons to their clients, um, that they have organizational capability. And that's what this, the orange box at the top is. There's your scheme. And it, it was very quickly apparent that you can't have a scheme without a standard. So that's that top left-hand box. The rest of the, the, the diagram really shows us how that, that system or the standard sets us, that's the system, the standard for the scheme that somebody will have that may or may not be part of a, other safety management systems that or quality management systems, fire safety management systems that organization has, um, and then how it relates to the other various PAS standards um, through the legal requirements. We're also working on golden thread and assurance of information. It is really clear that buildings need to be assured. What were the criminal responsibilities um, that will be attributed to anybody involved in design or construction? 
um, along with some of the civil liabilities that will follow in due course. Uh, every part of a design needs to be assured. And you're also handing over buildings to, certainly if you're dealing with a higher risk building, you're handing over buildings to people that need to manage them in accordance with part four when that's uh, enacted or when that's um, commenced, sorry. And those people need evidence that that building is designed and built uh, properly. So there's a clear need for an insurance process set out in, in this slide. Where does that link in with um, what we're doing with the list? Well, the list is, a, a, um, it's been developed over about three years with a number of, um, of experts on the group to try to get a complete list of things that one needs to manage or, or, or have in place uh, a high-risk building. How do you use that list? Uh, the idea is that you would take that list, you would identify which bits of those lists apply to your building. We've also linked in with the CIOB and ROBA um, Guide to Managing Safety Critical Elements, which is an approach for looking at which bits of a building are safety critical and need to be managed, uh, and then apply this assurance diagram to it. And how that looks like in practice is that you would go down the list that we have, you would identify whether the item was relevant to the building, uh, you would then identify whether it was either safety critical or mandatory, there's some things you just have to have in place, um, documents, forms, processes, um, and then you would carry out that assurance. You'd probably, if you were constructing a building, your assurance is cover obviously covered forward as you do it. Uh, as you're reviewing it, you'd probably review it backwards. Uh, the fact you didn't have all of the information wouldn't necessarily mean that you don't have enough information. So you would do a, a, a risk assessment at the end uh, and try to identify whether you think that you, you've got enough information to manage that building, uh, whether there's other inf related information that allows you to, to manage it, or it's safety critical or mandatory and you don't have enough information, therefore you need to go out, out and get that information. Uh, those are the two major pieces of work we're doing. They are both in development. We encourage involvement of others. So if you're interested in being involved, um, you've got both of our, our details there. Anthony, anything else you want yeah, to Yeah, great. Add? Mark, thank you very much. I just say, he makes it very, look very simple. There's a, an awful lot of work that's gone into that. and. Uh, it's a fairly proven way of doing it. We are running tests on all of that, uh, but we really would encourage people to come uh, and join in with it because we're, we're trying to cover a lot of ground. And I look forward to seeing you on the panel. Denise, back to you. Well, thank you. Thank you very much, um, Anthony and Mark, for, for informing us about the work of the Building Safety Alliance. Uh, I know that they both work absolutely tirelessly uh, to to get their building uh, safety alliance established. So um, fantastic work there. Um, I'd now like to ask Jack White, the technical manager of Clarion Housing Group, uh, to unmute himself and uh, share his presentation on uh, information management in practice uh, across housing projects. Uh, over to you, Jack. Thank you. Um, can can you see my screen, Denise? Just just to check before I start speaking. Yeah, that's fine, Jack. Okay, great. Thanks. Um, yeah, so I'm going to talk to you a little bit about um, the the work that um, myself and my team have been doing at Clarion um, on our golden thread. And, and just to stress that this is for existing buildings. Um, now, I would say uh, existing buildings are um, a little bit overlooked. Um, you know, if you look at the percentage um, of buildings uh, in the future that will be uh, already built, um, and then if you think, well, actually, once once built in the near future, will you know um, take on changes as as they're managed, as they're in operations. You know, this this operational phase is 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 really key. Um, it's obviously the 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 highest risk, um, and I think you know the the there's not quite enough joined up thinking between that construction and um, and operations now uh, i think that's often an operations fault for not saying exactly what we need um and hopefully i'll i'll, I'll cover what i think some of that is today i think 
one of the one of the things that we've perhaps um struggled with is um that translation of of BIM into asset management. There's been a real focus on on BIM um, and what that means. But um, you know, there are obviously um major differences between you know, working together as a group on a design and the operation of a building. So what we try to do is start with a, a blank slate and think, what what would we like? What's, you know, best practice? How can we derive the most value from, um, you know, uh, we obviously are about to go through a, a period of change. How can we make sure we're maximising our, our value and in, in the changes that we take on? Um, so just to, to kind of start with what what does our existing data look like? Um, I think a lot of people will will suffer from same types of problems. So, you know, documents sitting um, uh, within a project manager's um, folder on on their own device. Um, you know, a lack of naming convention for files. The the information within that you know different from from one to another. It not being linked and joined up. Um, you know, and that to go alongside missing information, you know, out of date information, all, all, all the, the, the types of problems that we have. So just looking at the best practice, this is a, a an O&M file cavity barrier um, for one of our blocks of so previously working on cladding replacement. And um, this is an example of best practice, I say, where we have the O&M, um, everything seems to be in place, but we have a... Um, a, a, a an excerpt from that from that file there, and you can see in the in the second column, nominal fire rating. We've got anywhere between fifteen minutes um, and three hundred minutes now. One, we don't really know where that product was in, installed. Um, we don't know which of these products it was, so we we don't know what what fire rating we're getting. We don't know what the intention was. You know, we could have three hundred minutes, but only need fifteen. Um, and we don't know if that product was substituted on site. So even even in that kind of best case scenario where we were, um, there was still a lot of a lot of questions uh, and a, a lot of issues. Um, so we we kind of thought, what um what do we want? Um, and we kind of split that down into into three main ways that we want data. Um, now one is in a database, um, and that's great in terms of having information you know at, at your fingertips really quick and easy to to understand you know whether you want to create a, a program of works whether you're under, wanting to understand where you have certain um uh, risks and um, you know it's really easy to identify i said there you know where you have um firefighting lifts or if you wanted to you know you've got grp doors where where do you have them and create a program of works so you know that allows you to do it really easily in a way that documents and next part you know you, you wouldn't be able to do you won't don't want to be going back into a document for every single door to see if it's a if it's a grp door so that's where you want the database that being said documents um are absolutely critical you know that for you know project specific work really in-depth information um you need to be able to access them uh, in a way that information in there wouldn't be wouldn't be suitable in a database whether it just you know the the um, maintenance to upkeep that data, um, or the the size of the database, etc., would just make it um unwieldy. And so you know documents being a, a a key other part, and then the third part of it being the the geometry. So understanding um uh, where things are in a spatial location. Um now we've obviously looked at that and we've gone down the 3D modeling route um, because we think there's a number of um, benefits that gives us, but um, uh, I don't think, um, you know, it's it's necessarily a 3D model. That's why I would say it's um, geometry is, is the thing you're looking at there. And um, we've also got to consider the, the data sources. So where do we get the information from? So we, in, in operations, there's obviously um, a range of different ways that we interact with our buildings. So going out and doing inspections and surveys, um, more generally um, assessments, repairs, installs. So there's a lot of a lot of work done to to maintain something and understand, you know, the condition of an asset, you know, when it needs to be replaced, etc. And um, and then there's a number of stakeholders that that we need to interact with as well, and who can be kind of people that we provide data for, but can of course be data sources. So our resident, if they were to complain, which of course they hopefully wouldn't, but our contractors, consultants, and, and internal employees going out and looking at a building. So that's all got to be considered as well. 
And so we're kind of um, looking at that. We thought, well, how how do we how do we bring that all together? Um, and each of those things is is linked by uh, location. Um, uh, so the the way to then understand um, what those locations might be, and you can see hopefully on the on the right hand side there. So we've got anything from you know an estate down to an element, an element being either a part of the building or um, a component. Um, we can see exactly where everything is. Um, now we've got to to be able to say, well, what is that location um, quickly and easily? Um, you know, we're creating a unique ID using a classification system so that we can look at an ID for um, whether it's a, a unit, so residential property or an element within that or an estate and can quickly identify exactly what that is uh, and, and where it sits um, within this hierarchy. So we have developed a system, um, a platform that allows us to look at this. So we're looking down through our, a certain state here and the, um, the buildings in it, the core in it different levels and then within a flat we're looking at um, a, an internal hallway and we can see the different um, components that are within that so it allows us to really easily drill down and get an understanding of, of what we have and where we have it and um, that being said that that allows us to understand where things are but obviously we want to understand um, uh, in, in greater depth than that and um, so we want to know um, more about that um, the 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 element there, so that thing installed in the hallway, and then if we've got a lot of them installed across our stock, what, what do we know about that type of thing, and um, what is the what is the requirement for it? So we set that out as well in terms of looking at you know we go in and, and we look at a specific unit, and it's got that code that I'm talking about to allow us to understand where it is in the hierarchy, and we can see what the requirement is, so the design intent. So for this door closer, we can see there's a fire door requirement. So we need a we need a functional door closer. We can see when it was installed, who it was installed by. Of course, not in this um, example, because that is um, unfortunately what we come across for existing buildings. Um, but it, it gives us the opportunity to capture that. And then we can go and see that this was a door closer overhead slide arm um, and, and really understand what, what those elements are and how they might work. Um, then to get a more kind of a, a wider understanding, of course, these these elements don't work in isolation. Um, so we group these together into systems. Uh, and so you will see this external wall system. And of course, the external wall system has a lot of a lot of elements that are not external wall, um, but are uh, windows, flues, etc., as well as those external walls. So we can understand, OK, how are these things fitting and working together? And if we have an assessment done um, against that, external wall system, it includes those those elements as well. And then the, the bit that gets other people excited, uh, the, the 3D models. Um, so it's, again, I think very, very useful in terms of um, the kind of data you can extract from it, obviously being able to create floor plans as well, um, a click of a button, but we can understand where things are, gives us a chance to validate in terms of, well, how many stories is this building? We can go and look and, and understand, well, where is flat 12 in comparison to flat six? What are the risks? Um, but then we can go in and we can understand that. We can go and we can click on an element. So here, a, a, um, a flat entrance door, um, and then uh, understand what information we have about that. Again, it's got that, that code that I'm saying that links everything together. And then we can click on that to go back into the database to, to allow us to understand the, the information about that. Um, then moving on to the, the documents. Um, so when I'm saying storing information about that for that door, it might be you know a, a third party certificate. And um, so we want to store that document against that that specific door. So when we have documents uh, in our system, uh, they all have metadata attached. So we can see down at the bottom there. There's a location. Um, now we could we could, um, save that. We've got different organisations in there. We've got different teams. And that so we can click on that. It's a smart system, so we can go and, and find out information about that. But then we can go in and, and, and look at the, the document as well and see um, what it is that we need to see. But it's easy to find. We've got different revisions, so you can make sure you're looking at the most up-to-date version of it. If you want to see, if you know, if we want to know when things are going out, out of date, we have that there. So we can then run um uh, reports from the system to see um what documentation needs to be um needs to be updated soon. 
Uh, and then I think the bit that's often overlooked, the kind of it's not just having that, you know, snapshot of information. You know, this information is is constantly being updated. Um, so we need to think, well, you know, okay, well, if we need to do certain checks on a door, then we can schedule activities or 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 just um uh, track them. Um, but we can say, okay, well, we want to do a door check and we want to do it by this date and create that kind of um a stream of work and we can save those um the results of those in standardized um uh, output documents that allow us to, to to access as a database and if we wanted to say okay well what for doors the door results have you know um excessive gaps you know we can run a report and, and run all those because that information is being captured in that database format um and then the Last part again, I'll probably say that things are, are, are overlooked a, a, a bit too much, but I think um you know what we're looking for is a, a highly structured um kind of data uh, that allows us to really understand um our buildings. But none of that is um of any use really if um we don't keep that up to date and um to make sure we do that in a consistent format um where where you know it's um, one person in you know patch A is doing the same as the person in patch B. When that information comes into us, we're processing it in the same way to give everyone that that confidence in in the data. We need protocols in place, so we need you know a roadmap. So we need um you know a suite of documents that that set out exactly how we do things. We need those um manuals and templates to allow us to to utilize um. Uh, you know, can be other systems in terms of apps to, to bring in that data, but then once it comes to us, it's that interoperability um, we're, we're mapping against our system, inputting that data, and that data is is there. Um, it's it can be you know near live um, and uh, accessible for for people um, across the team. Um, and that's it. Thank you. Well, thank you very, very much, uh, Jack, for that really uh, informative uh, presentation. Um, great system there by, by the look of it. Um, so finally, it's time for Ben Thomas, who's a senior account executive at Idea uh, Gen Mail Manager, um, to uh, give us his presentation. So you could unmute yourself, Ben, and uh, away you go. Thank you. Thanks very much. Thank you, Denise. Uh, yeah, and hello, everyone. Thanks very much for for taking the time um, to to join today. So, I suppose building on on what Jack was talking about a lot in this session, I was going to cover really what this means for the current project management landscape for architecture, for engineering and construction firms specifically, and I suppose delve a bit deeper into what the single source of truth actually means in practical terms. Um, and why it's so important. And then I'll talk through how we've helped firms reduce risk, delays, a bit of rework as well that Jack was touching on a moment ago too, really by using and, and leveraging technology and how you can then transform your information management with, with machine learning. So um, initially, I suppose, as we see it, and, and as a lot of our clients have, I suppose, articulated to us, what is the current state of play in the project landscape? So the technology landscape really globally is changing at an ever increasing speed and you know, this is no different for any company certainly not least with architecture engineering and construction industries um, and i'm sure you've all noticed and i'm probably preaching to the choir a bit for everyone on the call today that in your own work technology is continuing to rapidly evolve and really drive the aec to become a much safer cheaper and quicker um industry really and now it's no surprise that with everything going on in the world right now and the teams either working remotely or in a bit of a hybrid working environment, which seems to be the, the norm at the moment, that it's becoming more and more difficult really to access the correct project information uh, that you need to. So AEC professionals like yourselves really rely on strong, consistent communication. And this might take the form of you know, pitches, winning clients, day-to-day -day conversations with colleagues, but I'm afraid you know the days are gone or certainly limited nowadays to where you can turn around to the desk next to you and ask a colleague to help you find an email, for example. So what this means for a lot of people really is that they don't have the access to the information that they need and that they're left out of the communication loop. And as you can imagine, you know, this causes a huge issue in a lot of uh, conversations and communication gaps. Um, 
a stat that always astounds uh, myself and, and you know, uh, clients when we speak to them is that over 347 billion emails are expected to be sent and received every year, um, or rather every day uh, in 2023. And email is the most used communication and collaboration tool around the world, but it's the one thing really that most people manage differently. So one of these risks comes from the form of project rework, as I touched on, and a recent study conducted found that 80% of project professionals spend half of their time on rework and poor, poor communication costs around $62 million on year, every average. Um, so reworks don't just waste time and money, but obviously cause a huge communication breakdown within your project team and with your senior executive team and stakeholders and, and the like. So... Here at um, IdeaGen Mail Manager, we run an annual survey, which really aims to discover and uncover the project management and collaboration challenges facing businesses globally, like I say, within the AEC industry specifically, but not exclusively. So the report explores how firms manage project information, where they store it, and how they go about retrieving data when facing legal disputes specifically. So we surveyed over 550 AEC leaders from businesses around the world, from a varied roles within their organizations, from CEOs all the way to project leads, and found that um, some of the key findings were becoming consistent. So four things that came up more than most, and just to kind of jump into this year's 2023 report, firstly, that the majority of firms cannot easily access their project information. And like I mentioned, I think this, this really links into one of the first slides that Jack shared with, with us a moment ago. Um, and we found that only 10% of respondents were not concerned about the accessibility and visibility of project information. So most see it as a really big challenge. And in fact, only 2% of respondents never need to retrieve emails from past projects. Um, the second substantial finding was that over a quarter of organizations are at risk when staff's and staff members leave the business. So our research found uh, that more firms are aware of the importance of filing emails as part of that offboarding process, as well as kind of a real strong um, language and culture when people join the business as well. Um, and in 2022, so last year, less than half of the respondents, around 44%, indicated that employees were required to file all project-related emails into a central location, you know, that, that single source of truth that we referred to already. And this year, that number has risen to 58%, which is you know well, great to see. Um, but unfortunately, still 28% deem it not a requirement for emails to be filed. And so often this information is lost or rather locked within individual silos or or within you know the memory bank of individual project leads. Um, thirdly, disputes are continuing to rise. I suppose that's not really a surprise given the, the data just ran through, but our 2021 report uh, found that 63 of respondents experienced some form of dispute um, in their businesses in the year. And that number has only risen to a disturbing 91% um, this year, which is significant, obviously. And the project scope changes and payments continue to be the leading cause of these disputes. And considering the majority of project scope information resides within emails and formal documents, and firms cannot easily access this, it's hardly surprising that there's continuing to be this, this, um, uh, this rub and this friction, and they just dig themselves into trouble. And the final finding is really that email is still the most uh, uh, heavily used communication and collaboration tool in the industry. Again, probably no surprise to those of you on the call, but more than four fifths of respondents reported that the vast, vast majority of the project correspondence is done by via email. I think only around 20% of respondents use email for less than half of their project correspondence. Um, so, you know, for the purpose of our session today, we'll be focusing on the disputes angle of our research, but we'll also be really honing in on how the ability to find and access everyone's emails, even the things that you as an individual wasn't necessarily um, CC'd in initially, can massively help with this dispute resolution. Um, so according to the World Bank, you know, we are currently... Um, in the second year of sharply slowing economic growth, only overshadowed by the global recessions of 2009 and 2020. And in the AEC, we're seeing trends where costs are on the rise, margins are tighter than ever, um, and there are a large amount of staff cutbacks. Even larger global firms have reported huge drop-offs in profit um, as their staff costs are increasing. So with so much uncertainty and so many people leaving their businesses, there is a strong need for organizations to really have a strong think about their information management as a whole and, and how people are ensuring that they're managing this in the correct way. So how can you be sure 
that you really have access to all the documents and correspondence if a staff member were to leave. And I suppose, arcing back to that previous uh, slide, considering 28% of businesses do not have email filing as part of their major offboarding process, and 81% of firms use email for the majority of project correspondence, there are thousands of firms who are at a massive amount of risk of losing that information. Um, and even more concerning is the finding that just over half of those surveys in our report indicated that they did not have any single information email management system in place. So I'm sure everyone on the webinar today has heard or maybe read the phrase email is dead, but at least in our industry, those claims are, uh, are quite frankly inaccurate. And you know, in 2023, 88% of the surveyed respondents indicated that the overall volume of email has only increased in the last 12 months. So um, like I mentioned, unfortunately, and it is an unfortunate fact, but we're seeing that the project costs are continuing to spiral, which has led to an increase in disputes um, within the AEC. Um, Continuing to sort of look back at that uh, report that we conducted over the last 12 months, we've found that only 9% of people surveyed have not experienced a dispute in the last 12 months from, you know, really sinister ones to sort of maybe minor technical and, and financial disputes. And this is significantly higher than previous two years uh, of, of the same report that we've conducted. Um, so we're consistently seeing that failing to make email visible and accessible to project teams can only cause issues that result in legal disputes. And according to the Arcadis report of 2022, the Global Construction Disputes Report, the global average value of disputes was around 52.6 million US dollars with an average length of about 15, 16 months. Um, and firms cannot afford really to let information like email correspondence slip through the cracks. And we've really seen this leaky bucket of email um, negativity affecting the AEC global um, uh, firms recently. And really firms must, as I mentioned, be aware of, of the corporate history and, and be able to prove everything uh, that has happened on a project, especially as the stakes are so high. Um, so that's been a kind of a quick overview of, of our AEC report. And you know we'll send through a, a full report as well in the next few days if you're interested to read a little more. Um, so what does this really mean for information management and how can you help, or rather it is, is a fact, help you avoid disputes going forward? And I mean, lucky for us, as I touched on earlier in the presentation, technology advancements are continuing to improve how we work. And as I touched on earlier as well, AEC firms are really increasingly using tech um, and leveraging it to boost efficiencies. VR, 3D uh, modeling, as, as Jack touched on as well, can really help identify these errors before construction even exists in some examples. So, um, and really BIM advancements as well mean that the team members can all be on the same page. And the use of BIM has seen several benefits in the global industry, including you know, the reduction of waste, um, improving collaboration, enhancing productivity, time savings, overall increase in technology adoption. And it's improving the safety across the industry as well and provides really deep insights into the existing buildings as well. So while we all need to embrace this new technology that's making our lives easier and really boosting the industry, it's hardly surprising that it's harder than ever um, to access the information and ensuring that teams follow this information process. So um, I suppose one thing to keep in mind is that if your single source of truth isn't fully complete, then really it's not the truth. And these communication gaps can cause a huge amount of, of, um, uh, of you know, industry disputes. And what we've seen in our research as well is that while firms are stringent about how their documents and contracts are managed, email seems to be the one thing that everyone manages maybe in a slightly different way. It's often you know, the, the process or outlook is the tool that people have just managed the same way for a number of years. And really without the right tools and automation in place, Project teams are left to their own devices to make their own decisions or in a, in a you know, vast majority of instances, just kind of keep email within their inbox unorganized. So when emails are managed correctly, everyone in the organization has access to the information they need to make the decisions in the right timeframes, um, whether they were involved in the initial conversation chain or not. And obviously it provides a much better way of working and encourages more transparent communication and really ensures that all team members have access to the information that they need um, and can work collaboratively. So I've gone through that in a good bit of detail. I mean, it's time really to avoid this common email um, headaches. I'm sure you've all on this call heard similar variations on, on a theme, but these are some of the things that we hear our clients say to us when they're looking at implementing our dear gents mail manager across their business. 
little things like, you know, this is what we agreed. When did you tell us this? So and so has left the company. So I'm coming into a bit it's a bit cold. This project was handed off to me in, in similar similar phrases, I'm sure are all really familiar to, to those of you on the call. And some of the benefits of this centralized information include the data becoming more discoverable, that eliminates the human error through automated workflows, establishing good version control. We hear a lot. Um, reducing the amount of time wasted in searching and recreating lost documents. And then I suppose most importantly, complying with regulatory and legal requirements as well. And that's really where we um, here at IDAJ Mail Manager come in. So as a bit of background for those of you that haven't heard of the system before, or maybe don't even know who Arup are, um, a bit on who we are and, and where we come from. So if those of you that haven't um, heard of, of Arup, they're a global consultancy firm who have worked on design and engineering projects, including the Sydney Opera House, Queens Ferry Crossing in Edinburgh, and more recently, um, the Sagrada Familia in, in Barcelona. Um, Arup built the solution mail manager around 12, 13 years ago internally. And the reason being they had no control over their staff managing their emails. Yes, we did have processes in place that people were supposed to adhere to. We tried things like public folders, project email addresses, your manual drag and drop into server project folders as well. But of course, all of these procedures relied on the individual to remember, to decide what's important, where to file it, and then take the time to actually do it. And invariably at one of those three or four stages, people missed information. So I guess the two issues that we had was one project team didn't have up-to-date information on their jobs, especially those that were new to projects as we touched on. But another big thing was risk. For us, we had to retain data for up to 14 years after a project had finished. And in a case of any claims or litigation, there was a chance that we we, were, we could find the information if push came to shove, but it would have been extremely difficult and time consuming when involved traipsing around a lot of current and, and ex-employees inboxes as well or relying on on IT very heavily to, to do a bit of a deep dive. So um, Arup really wanted to find a system that would allow them and their project teams to be able to find that information across the projects within a few clicks, really to take away that reliance away from people to have to think about it and also the time that it takes to, to take that action. They needed something they could turn on overnight that would just start learning behaviors and intuitively prompt and predict them to find to, to file these conversations. Couldn't find anything in particular that did that off the shelf to so develop their own. And I suppose fast forward uh, to today, a, a couple of hopefully familiar faces on screen there um, to clients that have, that have used the software as well. And some more here, I suppose, better well known across the industry and, and a couple of, of quotes and um, uh, and phrases from the trusted people that, that were involved in the implementation process for Mail Manager, the decision to roll it out, and that have been benefiting it from it from a, for a number of years now. So what are the key challenges we've, we, we help solve? I've touched on a lot of these already, but just to go over quickly, the risk of losing information, the time it takes to find and access that information, as well as file it. I suppose a broader lack of control across the company. And then finally, as Jack touched on as well, the information being kind of locked and siloed into individual cubby holes, if you like, and they're not being that single source of truth that you can reliably go to with confidence that everything you need to access is there. Um, so with Idea Gen Mail Manager, we give our customers the confidence that email has been filed, it can be retrieved and accessed really quickly. So I'll run through two-minute presentation here as I'm also conscious of uh, of everyone's time but as far as what the software is and also I noticed there's a couple of questions coming in the Q&A so if anyone's got any questions on this following bit or anything I've covered please feel free to to, to send through there and we'll, we'll do our best to answer in the next couple of minutes but Mail Manager is an Outlook add-in it sits within everyone's ribbon at the top here and it links into your existing filing structure whether that's an on-premise server a SharePoint or somewhere else and what Mail Manager does to ensure that people file is it prompts and predicts them to capture email. So if you reply to someone, it would do that. If you opened up a new email from a colleague or an external party, let's imagine someone's asking about a change in scope or approving something. When you go to close that conversation down where most people might forget it and move on with their day, well, Mail Manager intervenes and it prompts them to file predicting the exact project or the exact client folder that email should be assigned to. So when I hit file, that conversation is now put into that single source of truth, that central folder for everyone to access. And I can then go and access that, or my colleagues can, if I left the company tomorrow for argument's sake, through this mail manager search. Clicking on this button here, 
opens up this window so you can see everything. You can go into a project at this filter at the top here, see all emails to do with that job or specific people that were working on that project, whether they were involved in it still or had left the company a couple of years ago, as my colleague Georgina had in this example here. And you can even search keywords amongst a whole host of other um, uh, details and, and refinements there as well. Um, so I'll hand back over to, to Denise and Justin, but thanks so very much for listening. And like I say, please feel free to, to send some questions through to the Q&A. Well, thank you so much, uh, Ben, for that really engaging presentation and uh, taking us through your 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 really uh, clever system and um, all, all the great advice there. It's uh, time now for uh, Q&A. We have about 10 or so minutes. Um, so could I ask uh, Jack and Anthony uh, to join me uh, on screen, please, uh, with Ben, and uh, we'll, we'll get on with um, some Q&As. Thank you very much, everyone who's sent in uh, questions. Um, if we don't have time to go through them all, uh, our, our panelists have said that they will uh, answer afterwards if you put your name. I mean, I, I don't, if you put a question anonymously, I don't think we, we can get in touch with you. So, OK, um, just coming back to uh, the work of the uh, building safety um, alliance. I mm -hmm. think uh, we'll begin with uh, a question from uh, Bryn um, Manwaring, who's asking about you know IC, I, ISO nineteen uh, six fifty series talks about yeah. individual capability, um, which has the same definition for competence mm -hmm. as in the ISO nine thousand series. Yeah, he's saying is the relationship between competence for the individual capability and organizational capability, um, in the context of, of the golden thread being considered as well? Does that, um, uh, no, yeah, it is. I mean, there's quite a lot wrapped up in there, Bryn, as you no doubt know. Um, that there are a lot of, um, places within the ISO, British Standards, practices, best practices, guidance, where the concept of uh, competence or, or, or um, organisational um, capability is mentioned, but they're all slightly different in a different context, hence that our intention um, with others and UCAS uh, 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 um, is to bring these together in the context of the built environment, most particularly within the... Um, uh, occupied sector. Now, the, there is within the occupied sector, uh, PAS 8673 is so specifically designed to deliver uh, the information that the individuals working in the management of s s building safety will need. That deals with the individual side of it. Um, the organisational capability is fundamentally looking at how an organisation, big or small, because uh, uh, as Mark was talking about, um, we've got to be able to deal with micro organisation. We might be one or two or three people, as well as a huge tier one organisation. So the, the 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 concepts have got to fit both. Um, and what I was really trying to we're trying to get across is the idea of organisational capability. Is how do you manage the competence of all the people in your organization whether they be direct employers or third parties and i saw another question relating to sub 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 contractors uh, and that being a weakness indeed it is uh, in the long run just as part of part answering that one as well um there is a there is discussion going on about how we might have a an accredited and creditable card system such that those who work on HRB specifically carry a card which says that they're qualified and you can have a reader in your um in 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 the front door of your of your um HRB organization uh which reads it um but coming back to the wider sense the point of organisational capabilities, you, the organisation has got to look, as in any other ISO or British standard, many of you will have been organised, will, will have been involved with trying to deal with them. The first thing you've got to do is work out what is your organisation trying to sell or deliver, whatever it happens to be. 
then what are all the regulations and best practice that, that sit beside that to enable you to do that? Uh, and that is generally already done when companies have got these ISOs. What we're saying, and, and well, what the industry is saying, is you need to check that throughout collectively your organisation, you've got enough people with the skill sets, the, the SCEB, which includes behaviours, uh, and in the simplest terms, uh, with regard to individuals, behaviours is integrity to do the right thing, not to work outside your capability and only to take on work that you're competent to do. But it needs to be, um, the organisation needs to ensure to itself and it manages that it has the competencies to deal with all the stuff it sells or offers it, to make sure it's fit to do so. Now, whether that be at an organisational level or perhaps at a project level for the same reason, okay. meaning that if they're employed to do a project, they need to make sure the people on the project are competent to deal with it. OK, a bit thank long -winded, you. long-winded, but I hope that answers it. No, that's great. I'm just going to give you a couple of other questions, Anthony, mm. um, if you don't mind, both from John Griffiths, and maybe you could answer yeah. them together. Um, he's asking, are you aware of competency requirements for project managers and quantity surveyors under the Building Safety Act, uh, both at an individual and organisational capacity? Um, yes. And then will you be compiling a directory of organisations, I guess, meaning uh, the uh, safety allowance that hold PAS 8671? Two, three, et cetera. Yeah. Um, if I deal the second bit first, okay. uh, uh, John, very early on in all of this work at CSG level, um, so we're talking about three or four years ago, we, as an industry, went to the regulator, or as it was MHCLG policymakers at the time, and said someone's got to hold registers of all of this. Because unless industry can ring someone or go online and find out that an individual and organization is who they say they are all this works a waste of time um regulator has said they are not going to do it it's for industry to do there are pros and cons of doing it uh, and the answer is it is under discussion will the alliance hold a register of registers is a question i can't answer we have discussed it there are pros and cons for it but with the various other hats that I hold, um, I do know that the matter is discussed at length and at a high level. Um, uh, it's just how best to deliver that service. So the answer is keep an eye on it. Uh, it will happen. With regards to the, um, the, the various others, and I would include um, all the other disciplines that are involved in construction and design, their legal requirement is is to make sure anything that's designed or anything any works that are undertaken are in compliance with uh, building regs but of course their professional bodies will have competence requirements as they at the various stages of membership or chartership or whatever whatever term they use uh, and overall for the whole built environment there's a there's a, a standard for an individual called at the moment bs flex 8670 free from the BSI, as all of these things are. And that sets out the standard competence framework for every individual in every discipline, with the idea being that that document is taken into the professional bodies, trade bodies, and even big companies, and they will map what they have to date been doing to get their individuals up to a certain level of competence against that framework. And that framework, as I say, it's Flex 8670 and is currently being turned into a full British standard. I hope that answers that, John. If not, then uh, please ask a supplementary. OK, well, thank you so much, Anthony. Um, I'm going to move on to Jack mm -hmm. and a few questions for you, Jack. Uh, I'm going to wind three questions uh, together because um, they're, they're very related. Uh, someone's asking how long and how many people did it take to develop your platform? Um, and do you intend on sharing protocols and best practice uh, with other residential developers and um, housing associations? And then how do you manage the con document control uh, on the doc storing? And is this um, a bespoke platform for Clarion? Clarion? So it's really about development and um, 
what's the, 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 the what's the plan now really yeah uh, thanks and it, so it it, it it um i guess as, as i said we kind of started with that black slate and when i say we it was that was mostly mostly me in terms of setting out how how we wanted to work and and looking at how we wanted to link different information together and then went to went out to look at um you know what systems were available to do that now we didn't find anything that had all that functionality so we started working with um bentley um to create the um uh, a system that did that using their alim platform asset lifecycle information management um and so we've been working with them for um uh, probably a year and a half um actually working on that to to get that uh, to the functionality that we want now um uh i don't think they've kind of started officially launching it as a, a product that's available but if, if you were to contact them then i'm sure it would be you know we we are not you know trying to name things within the system you know something internal to to clarion but you know um product project management id or whatever it might be so that that is you know um applicable to anyone um so hopefully that that answers uh, uh how long it's taken who uh, there was it, it was more, mostly myself and, and and one person from bentley so understanding the assets asset management data and then uh data data structures and and a bit of kind of crossover to to do that um then in terms of uh yeah we are we're always happy to to share um i don't think i just want to just give everything out and say that's how it should be done i, I mean I'm, I'm really keen that other people do this and and do it and we you know we've tried things and failed um uh, and take a lot of learning from that i'm quite keen that other people do that so i don't necessarily just want to share everything but always happy to share ideas always happy to talk um and always happy to kind of see what we're doing and hopefully at some point um then share um what we have to to the wider um industry um and it was something about controls um i think yeah how, how do you manage the, the yeah, control and the... we're just starting to kind of work on on those protocols and you know we try and work you know each time we try and do something we try and take a small area get it to work quite well in that and then and then look at rolling out so um we're we're doing that and understanding um you know who has responsibility how we want that responsibility to sit um you know how the data comes in how people access it and trying to get a really good understanding of all that and making our processes uh, align with that to make it as easy as possible for people to use not you know burdening them with lots of extra responsibility or or things to do um but it's that's very much a work in progress so it's not you know i, I can sit here and say i know we've we've we perfected that you know this is exactly how we're doing it wonderful thank you um Please, could i offer a, just an observation uh, about information uh, particularly for the audience of aps okay, and uh, CIB, is is the the information that we get in occupation from construction is is you know there's the transition between construction information which is packaged as jack will recognize as in packages uh, because it suits the construction industry to do it, and they're very well used to it. But actually, that structuring of um, information is not much use when you're trying to manage building risk in occupation. And then the transition, and it's something that, uh, that, that the Alliance are working on, is, is how to uh, uh, allow or enable the transition from construction structures, or a better expression, to occupied management of the, the particular bits. Uh, and, and that is a complex thing, and it's certainly something um, APS membership, I know, have been looking at across the piece. But it's the it's the difference in the structures as well as the assurance of the validity of the data you're getting anyway, which is another issue that I'm sure Jack has been very well aware of. Uh, Thank you. Thank you very much, Anthony. Um, I'm going to come to Ben. There's lots of um, questions about uh, the workings of... Uh, Email management uh, system. Um, so, mm -hmm. just a, a a couple of questions uh, posed to you live, and I'm sure you'll go back to people and answer afterwards if you can. Um, 
someone's asking what happens to duplicate emails. Um, perhaps you could also talk about whether iDigen is cloud-based or can it operate within an organization's in-house system? Um, and what happens when people leave uh, the business? Do they you still have access to all emails they've received? So Yeah, absolutely. Best. Thank you, Denise. Yeah, there's well, that, those are pretty common questions we hear. So um, thanks for writing them in. Like, like you said, there, there have been quite a few. So I'll, hopefully we can uh, get through to, to everyone after the call. But um, on the duplicate email point, um, we hear that a lot, certainly from, from people in, in IT as well who are concerned about storage. So what Mail Manager does is deduplicates uh, any copies. So, you know, if myself, Anthony and Jack were working on a project together and we all received an email from, from an external party and we all filed it to the single source of truth, i.e. the same project folder, only one original copy would be would be retained. Um, to, to Jim's question on is IdeaGen Mail Manager cloud-based or can it operate in an in-house system? Uh, the short answer is it can operate in either. So the system itself we would install um, for you, but it can link into cloud servers, on-premise servers, SharePoint, just to name a few of the most common uh, central data environments that, that we integrate into. But for a bit more information, Jim, we'll be very happy to reach out and, and understand a bit more about your process to make sure that it would work. Um, and then lastly, on people accessing emails if someone's left, uh, absolutely you can. So um, a very quick example I gave a moment ago was from a colleague of mine who'd left a couple of years ago. So, I mean, we hear all the time if there's projects running for multiple years, people join companies, they, they leave, um, they join projects halfway through. The whole benefit of Mail Manager is that you've got the entire project conversational history, the entire audit trail from the start of a project to the finish, irrespective of whether the five project managers that kicked the project off were the same five that finished it. So uh, yes, is the short answer to that. Well, thank you. Thanks very much, uh, Ben, for answering that. Um, I know we've got other questions, but I'm afraid uh, we've actually uh, run out of um time i'm afraid so uh we're gonna have to uh wrap it wrap it up um and uh before i do i just would like to uh thank everyone for um attending um to thank all of our uh speakers um for You're their welcome. great presentations and uh just to remind you all it is it is uh, recorded. Um, you will be able to uh, play it again um, afterwards. And uh, just to remind you that uh, there are sort of um, some. Sorry, I seem to have lost the the slide I was sharing. But we do we do have uh, email addresses and things like that that you can. Um, uh, go to afterwards. So uh, if you want more on iDigen Mail Manager, go to mailmanager.com. Um, Tarion, you can go to tarionhg.com. And for the Building Safety Alliance, go to uh, thebuildingsafetyalliance.org.uk. So thank you to Anthony, Mark, and uh, Jack and Ben for sharing your time. And thank you very much to IT again for supporting uh, this uh, webinar. Um, it's been really great and really informative and I've learned a lot and I wish I could have IT again on my email system. It's, um, so thank you very, very much. Thank you. Thanks very much, everyone. Cheers, everyone.